There are a few names as shrouded in mystery and conspiracy, and yet so well known that anyone could name them, like that of the Rothschild family. At one point, it's pretty much common knowledge that the family is the richest clan in the world, but at the same time, the amount of people claiming that they're behind conspiracies ranging from the New World Order to lizard people seems to know no end. So the question must be asked, who exactly are the Rothschild? What's the source of their wealth? How much power do they really have? And most importantly, is there any truth to the conspiracies about them? To learn the answer to those questions, we must take a look at many aspects of the family, starting with the history. Now, the story of how the Rothschilds turned into what they are now today really starts with one man and his dream of making a future for his family. That man was one Meyer Armshell Rothschild from the crowded, narrow, disease-ridden, and prejudiced Jewish ghetto of the German city of Frankfurt. You see, back in those days, there were many of these ghettos across European cities, and they all served one purpose, to provide a willing population of financial workers that could lend and borrow money on interest. The reason was that, according to Christian doctrine, Christians were not allowed to take an interest, and so most communities relied solely on their Jewish populations to do that. And the Rothschild family from Frankfurt was no different. Instead, they were a simple generational family that had grown a decent city-wide business mostly surrounding currency exchange. It's also from that ghetto that we get the origin of the word Rothschild. You see, the house the family lived in had a sign on the door embossed with a red shield, which in German is written as, you guessed it, Rothschild. Now, while the family's business had remained more or less confined within their home city, by the time Meyer grew up, stuff had changed drastically. You see, when he was 12, his father died from smallpox, making the responsibility of earning for the family fall entirely on the young man's shoulders. And to prepare for that, he was sent to practice with Simon Wolf Oppenheimer, a prominent Jewish banking house. And there, he was exposed to the thing that would eventually make him rich and what he would turn into, nobility. And this brings us to the second part of their story. The Rise You see, at the time, just like now, the rich people of society had a lot of investment in collecting valuables, including rare coins. And as someone who came from a family which had exchanged currency for generations, Meyer found himself quite in demand. And while some people would have used it as a simple opportunity to get rich, Meyer was smarter than that and used it to gather connections with the European elite. As a result, by the time he was running the family's business full-time, it took him no time to earn the first of many patronages, starting with Holy Roman Crown Prince Wilhelm of Hesse. By the time the Crown Prince had been crowned, Rothschild had enough support from the man that he has officially turned into a crown agent, making him effectively nobility. And so, by using his connections, charm, and opportunistic nature, Mayer had secured himself and his family a lovely social gig, but he was far from done. Expanding You see, during the late 1700s, when the story takes place, Europe was a place of upheaval, and countries were spending a lot of money around, which was really hard in those days. So by providing the hard-to-trust service of money lenders from behind a royal court of arms, the Rothschilds basically launched the most successful advertising campaign in history. By the time the new century rolled around, the family already had grown a fortune, and having seen how much international trade had benefited him, Mayor Rothschild sent his sons to live in Naples, Vienna, Paris, and London, the four centers of the European economy, to use the family's massive fortune to further promote international commerce. And so, when Mayer died, he had successfully transformed his family from a small money-lending gig in a ghetto to the world's first international bank, and that was just the beginning. After him, his son, Nathan Rothschild, moved to England, where he started a bank that operates to this day with a massive annual revenue of 1.87 billion euros over nearly 76 billion euros as assets. And then the family discovered another trick, using war to earn money. 
You see, while the initial idea of the multinational branches was to facilitate money transfers between governments, because of the start of the Napoleonic Wars, that was no longer possible. But instead of letting that become a reason for the failure, the family started to lend money to both sides of the war, which caused the war to drag on, making the government take out more loans and so on. Which, while many of us will consider that to be a downright villainous deed, back then and even today, that was just smart business. And since then, the family has only multiplied their wealth by further expanding their influences wherever they saw fit. And by not losing money in wars like many of their competitor rich families did, they only grew richer as empires fell and the world changed. This brings us to today and where the family stands now. Today. I'd like to start off by coming clean and telling you guys that while many people share the name Rothschild, the family is no longer really one unit. Instead, it's made up of dozens upon dozens of separate houses all operating in their respective fields and countries with pretty much nothing in common but a name. So when I say something like all Rothschilds, it's less me talking about one unit that makes coordinated decisions like the Koch brothers but more like a large group of people that share a common history, more like the collective European royalty. With that established, let's now talk about what you've all been waiting for. How much money do they have? One of the downsides of being basically the equivalent of a massive community that has nothing in common, trying to estimate the overall assets of all Rothschilds is a tricky task, with the estimates ranging from a couple hundred billion dollars to over two trillion. And that brings us to the question you're probably already wondering at this point. Seeing as there are no big Rothschild banks out there, how exactly does the family make money nowadays? How do they make money? Well, let's start off by saying that that question is even harder to answer than the previous one. Because while most people still call them a banking family, nowadays they're involved in everything from asset management, mergers and acquisitions, insurance, venture capital, pensions and investments, sovereign debt and commodities. They also have investments in infrastructure like the Suez Canal and are involved in activities like mining operations, industry, hotels, media, transportation and even wine. In terms of physical assets alone, the family has collected the largest collection of art over two centuries. They also probably own the largest familial collection of gold and, mind you, it's not in the form of gold-plated cars. Instead, the family is known to keep a relatively low profile, especially compared to other rich people. They also own extensive real estate everywhere from Europe to Asia. They still have the world's largest collection of private chateaus, owning 13 manors in Buckinghamshire alone. And, well, that's a pattern you see everywhere. The family that was once known for keeping it within a closely knit circle has today become one of the most diverse collections of business people and has helped create the single largest and most diverse family-owned portfolio out there. As a result, while the family might not be as well connected as it once used to be, one thing that's for sure is that no family will ever come close to the impact these guys still have in the world. Which finally brings us to the last two questions, namely, how much power do they really have? And is there any truth to the conspiracies about them? And well, as far as power is concerned, the family's power is very much like their assets, extremely intimidating when taken as a sum, but practically with the dispersed nature of the family as well as the spread out nature of their influence, it is not remotely as big a threat, especially as much as the theories claim. Which neatly answers the last question too, while it is true that the Rothschilds did finance wars for personal gains and as a unit, own immense shares in some of the world's largest industries, nowadays they're far too distributed to mean anything either, especially when the allegations often reach far into the stratosphere of the insane. But that being said, I am curious to hear what are some other conspiracy theories that might be true. So if you have an answer, feel free to share down below.